Let me ask you, stand as we join together singing, Come Thy Found of Every Blessing.
up and praise you because we are your people. Lord, we thank you for saving us. We thank you for bringing us to this place so that we can be a family. Lord, we just invite you here to participate with us as we try to lift your name up to this community. Lord, help us to shine your light boldly. And Lord, we just thank you for your love. We thank you for every blessing you give us each and every day. And Lord, just help us to be people of God serving you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Welcome. Welcome. It's good to see you today. It's a mostly good-looking congregation today. Amen. No, y'all look great. You look great. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. Good, good. If you're our guest today, we're glad that you've chosen to be with us. Uh, and we'd like for you to fill out a connection card that's in the pew back in front of you. And fill it out and drop it in the offering plate when it goes around. That way we can record your attendance here today. Uh, you can also use that card to uh, put a prayer request in or things like that as well. Again, it's good to see everyone today. Uh, let's take this opportunity and fellowship one with another. Let's stand. Tell somebody you love them today. again, right? So glad everybody's here this morning. Um, please bow with me for our offertory prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the honor of being in your house this morning, God, and looking at the, the wine and the wafers spread out here before us, God. Just, I just pray that a, a thankfulness, just 10,000 times what we might normally feel, God, that we, that we just Lord, are filled with gladness and filled with thankfulness that's from you. And that as we take, take up offering and as we later on participate in the Lord's Supper, that we examine ourselves 
that we are forgiven from you. There is no sin in our life, God, and that, that we are ready to ready to to be just soldiers, God, for you. And um, I ask that you bless the gift and the giver today, and I thank you. In Christ's name, amen. amen.
aren't you thankful for that mercy tree? Because without it, we could not have a relationship with God. And the next song just simply says, The Wonderful Cross. There was nothing wonderful for Jesus, but for us, it is a wonderful cross because he paid our debt that day. Amen? Let me ask you to stand as we join together singing, The Wonderful Cross. Well.
be seated. Let's pray together. Gracious God, Father of all creation, we thank you for the cross. Father, the cross seems as foolishness to those who are perishing. And Father, as we think about the cross, sometimes we think maybe, maybe this is such a strange way to save the world. But Father, your plan was put into place as the perfect plan of salvation before the foundation of the world. And you chose to redeem for yourself a people, a family, a kingdom out of all the nations of the earth and to redeem them through the blood of Jesus Christ that was spilled for the remission of sins, the body that was broken in our place. And so, Father, we thank you for the wonderful, magnificent, sorrowful, joyful cross of Jesus Christ. For without that cross, we would not have reason to gather here today. Without that cross, we would not have reason to celebrate the Lord's Supper at the end of this service today. And so, Father, as we go through our time of study this morning, I pray that you will help us to reflect on our own lives our own sin, our own hearts, so that as we partake of the Lord's Supper, we do not partake in a way or manner that is unworthy, but in a way and a manner that is repentive, that is focused on you, and that is all about worship of our great, awesome, magnificent, wonderful Savior and the work that he's done on the cross. Now bless our time together this morning in your word. Use it to edify, equip, and uplift your saints so that we can be busy doing the work that you've called us to, preparing to spend eternity with you in our eternal home, heaven, as part of your wonderful family. Thank you, Lord. Bless our time in Jesus' name. Amen. My dear, sweet, lovely mother gave me this tie for Christmas. <laughs> that is the one and only reason I'm wearing a yellow tie today. <laughs> I have been accused of rooting for the, the Rams today. Don't you put that on my sweet mother. No. I accidentally wore the wrong colors today. I hope nobody wins. I'm just still bitter about it. Each year, men are nominated from among the men in our church, and then at a later point, we'll have an election of those men that are qualified and willing to serve to become deacons in our church. Our deacon body is designed to consist of several men these men serve as spiritual leaders in the church to assist the pastor and the staff as they carry out the chief duties of equipping the people of God to serve the church. I don't know if you've studied the role and responsibility of a pastor from Scripture, but the chief role of the pastor is equipping the people of God. If the pastor simply serves the people of God, he can only serve as many as he has time for. But if he equips the people of God to serve one another, then we can do greater things together. And so the chief role of a pastor is to equip the saints of God. That's why the preaching ministry is the primary thing that a pastor does. The preaching and teaching ministry and the other things like uh, visiting the sick and, and, and uh, counseling and those things 
the, the counseling is even part of the teaching ministry, but those things are coming after the preaching. The preaching is first. And I'm very diligent to spend time doing that, but in order for the pastor to do these things, he has to have help. And so today, we are beginning a month-long process of nomination of deacons. So you will find in your bulletin a list of some of the things I'm going to talk about today, and then a space for you to nominate men. If you want to nominate one person, you may. If you want to nominate two or three people, you may. If you want to nominate, if you don't feel led to nominate anybody, you don't have to nominate anybody, okay? But these nominations will go to the deacons. The deacons are the one that screen them, make sure these people meet the qualifications. Um, they do that by interviewing the people and finding out about their lives, finding out about their spiritual condition, or by watching them, uh, looking at their church attendance and things like that. And then... Uh, this person has got to agree to serve. Okay, so you say, well, I nominated so-and-so, and they didn't get on the ballot. Well, they may not want to be on the ballot. That is the most likely scenario. You know, um, and so then we have an election. That's how it works. And we elect those men who are qualified to serve and willing to serve in the role of deacon. And as we begin this month-long process, the last Sunday in February will be the last time for you to enter a nomination. As we enter this month-long process, I have been planning to preach a sermon about deacons since I came. And so this is an appropriate time. It's important for us to know what the qualifications are, what a deacon is, what they are required to do in the church, and what they are called out to do, what qualifies a person to serve in this role. Why was the office of deacon or position of deacon created in the first place. And so we'll look at some texts this morning that lay that out uh, beginning in Acts chapter 6. You can go ahead and turn there, Acts chapter 6. But I want to note a couple of things before we begin looking at our text today. The first thing is this, and I'd like for you to listen very carefully because these are important. There is no such thing as a perfect deacon. Okay? There's no such thing as a perfect deacon. A deacon is a person just like you. Now, if you're perfect, let's have a discussion, okay? <laughs> but there's no such thing as a perfect deacon. Deacons are going to drop the ball sometimes. They're going to fail sometimes. They may even fall into sin from time to time. But it's the job of the other deacons to police that, uh, to observe that, and hold each other accountable. So there's no such thing as a perfect deacon. So if you're looking for a perfect deacon, you may find one when you get to heaven, but not on this side of heaven. Deacons should be men who demonstrate a pattern of obedience, a pattern of faithful obedience, not perfection, but a pattern of faithful obedience, and they should be willing to admit when they fail and fall into patterns of disobedience. Second, Second thing I'd like to point out before we get, get to going. Not every man in the history of Baptist churches in our country that serves as a deacon is actually qualified to serve. Let me say that again. Not every man that has served at a deacon at a Baptist church is actually qualified to serve. What I mean by that is sometimes people get elected because the people view it as a popularity contest. Or they elect the person that has power in the church rather than the person that's most spiritually and biblically qualified. So sometimes you'll get a deacon that shouldn't be a deacon. So it's important for the congregation and the deacon body to make sure that the people that we have serving as deacons are actually qualified to serve. It's a very serious thing. Don't just write down the name of the man that sits next to you on the pew because you think he's very nice to you. Pray about it. Write their name down. Put it in your Bible and pray about it every day before you turn it in. 
And then turn in a thoughtful, prayerful, heartfelt nomination. So today, we want to look at deacons. Turn to Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 7. Let's stand together as we read the first seven verses. And I realize that I did not have you stand last week, but I was medicated, so you'll have to give me a break on that. Okay. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because, of their, because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It is not right that we give up preaching the word to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of spirit and wisdom, whom will be appointed to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Porcherus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these men sat before the apostles, and they prayed and laid hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Father, bless our study of your word. Use your word to change our minds, to change our hearts, and to grow us more into what it means uh, to understand about a deacon. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now before we launch into the specifics of our particular text today, I would like to talk to you a little bit about what the Greek word deaconos, from which we get the word deacon, means. Uh, it is simply a word that can de de be defined first as a servant. So deacon actually means servant. Got it? So if I were to ask you, define deacon for me, you would say servant. So, so why don't we do that? Define deacon for me. Servant. Okay, there you go. Now y'all got it. So that's what a deacon is called to be. Now this morning we'll look at three areas related to the calling of the first deacons. And... We're basically, we'll be. Uh, let me just tell you what we're going to be looking at. We're going to look at the reason they were called, the requirements of their calling, and the results of their calling. Th those will be your points. So let's look first at the reason for their calling. The reason. Verses 1 and 2. Now in those days, the disciples were increasing in number. So they were, the church was growing. They were getting more people. A complaint arose by the Hellenists against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. The twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It's not right that we should give up the preaching of the word of God to serve tables. So as the church began to grow, there needed to be more structure needed. There needed to be an organizational structure needed. Uh, there needed to be something put into place, some kind of mechanism put into place where they could help the church as it growed. Uh, the church... <coughs> had uh, saturated Jerusalem with the gospel message. So the gospel message was going all throughout the city of Jerusalem and was now beginning to go into the surrounding areas. And their next task was begin to, Samar uh, to share the gospel with the Samaritans and the Gentiles, the Samaritans and the Gentiles. And so they were beginning to branch out and share the gospel, not simply with the Jews in Jerusalem, but with the Gentiles and the Samaritans. And as you can imagine, the spiritual needs of such a large and diverse congregation of new converts was overwhelming. And the apostles couldn't handle it. Their concern was to be going out sharing the gospel. Their concern was preaching of the word. Their, their, their goal was teaching the people that were brand new converts. You've got to figure, they were brand new. All these people that were accepting Christ as their Savior were brand new. These apostles had spent this time with Jesus, and they needed to teach what Jesus taught them to the people so that they could serve God the way that they needed to serve God. And so because of this, they didn't want to neglect doing that, and they needed to, to branch out and get some organizational structure. Now, dealing with spiritual growth issues 
as well as sin in the lives of believers, as well as physical, logistical care of the congregation can be somewhat uh, overwhelming at times. It can be difficult. You know, uh, as a pastor, I'm pulled in so many different directions. This person's having surgery. This person's doing this. This person's sick at home. This person's doing that. This person's doing that. This, this family needs help. This family needs that. And I'm being pulled in all these different directions. And I don't know if you know this, but I can't be everywhere at once. If I could be everywhere at once, I would do that as a detriment to my own family. Because I have to spend time with them too. Right? So there has to be a mechanism put into place to be able to help that. And the apostles needed some help. Now notice how Luke begins this description in the book of Acts about how they came to the realization that they needed some help. This had to be a Baptist church because it says a complaint arose. <laughs> if there is one thing we know how to do, it's complain for really no good reason. And sometimes we complain for a good reason. But, you know, we all come to church and we all want our own way. We all want to control some aspect of the church. And if it doesn't go the way we want it to, then we issue a complaint. And we're not really concerned about what benefits the kingdom more. We're more concerned about what benefits us. And so they had factions in this church. Can you imagine why they had factions in the church? The Hellenists are those who were Greek, who were Gentile in the church. Uh, they may have been, some of them, Jews, but they were in Hellenistic areas or G Greek areas. And they didn't have as much commitment to the, the uh, traditional Jewish things. But the Hellenists in the group were complaining because the Jews were only taking care of their own widows. They were neglecting the widows from outside that Jewish group. There was a legitimate problem. And so a complaint arose and they said, you know, it's not all getting taken care of. And it may have simply been a matter of the fact there was a daily distribution of food for these widows. They didn't have, you know, uh, a retirement plan or Social Security or Medicare and all of that stuff. They, the church cared for these people. The church helped these widows, uh, and, and, and they were being neglected. So, so there was this complaint that arose, it came to the apostles, and the apostles knew, hey, we can't deal with this. There's just too many. There's just too much going on. And so they said, let's make a solution. Let's develop a solution. And so they told the congregation, pick some men from among the congregation that meet certain requirements, which we'll look at in just a moment. When you find these men that meet these certain requirements, then we will look at them and make sure they meet the requirements, and then we'll appoint them as servants in the church. And notice what the apostle said. It's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. And then later in verse 4, but we will devote ourselves to prayer prayer and the ministry of the Word. So there are some implications from this that, that I want to point out from these words. The spiritual leadership of the pastor is an important function. The spiritual leadership includes things like preaching, teaching, spiritual counsel, dealing with sin, administration, things like that. The physical needs of the members is also important. But... It's not good for the pastor to neglect the spiritual leadership of the church in order to deal with the physical needs. So they become a secondary issue in the church. Now, the physical needs are important. We want to care for people when they're sick, when they're afflicted. We want to look after our widows in the church and make sure they're doing okay. But the pastor must have trustworthy men to help him meet these spiritual needs. They will be functioning in a role to assist the pastor, and it should be a spiritual role as well as a physical role. The biblical philosophy of the ministry is that the pastor's spiritual teaching and caregiving 
and spiritual advising and spiritual counseling of the church, spiritual caretaker. All these things are primary, and he has to have help with the rest. Y'all, y'all following me on that? Yeah. If you ever listen to Matt Chandler, he says, you track him with me? He tracks all the time. You ought to build a railroad, right? Uh, you, you follow me on that? So everything else the pastor needs help with. We have staff that helps with that. We have deacons that help with that. Now, I've been in churches where this was reversed. I've been in churches where the pastor was more concerned about physical caregiving than he was about preaching. And he may have been a pitiful preacher. I always say he couldn't preach his way out of a wet paper sack. You know, he may have been a pitiful preacher, but everybody loved him because he, he came and had coffee with them all the time. But there was no equipping ministry in the church because his preaching wasn't the focus of his ministry. This is not meeting spiritual needs. It's only meeting physical needs. It's meeting emotional needs. But the greatest need that we have as God's people is spiritual. Listen, we have physical needs. But listen, I got something to tell you. Everybody in here is going to die one day. And we won't have physical needs after that too much. And the focus of the rest of our lives will be on spending time with the kingdom of God and God our Father and Jesus. So we better be focused on our spiritual needs right now. We better have the importance of being equipped. We ought to be able to give a hope, a reason for the hope that is in us. We ought to be able to answer people's questions about the gospel. We ought to be able to answer people's questions about the Bible when they ask us. We should be equipped to do these things. So basically what I'm saying is that the deacons have been put into place for the reason of assisting the pastor with the rest of his duties so that he can focus on the teaching, the preaching, the spiritual counsel, and the equipping ministry of the church. Now before I move on, I will say this. The pastor should be doing those physical needs and leading out by example so he can teach the deacons and and the others in the congregation that help with that ministry how to do that. He should be doing it, and he should be leading by example, but he can't do it by himself or all alone. The requirements. What are the requirements of a deacon? Therefore, brothers, in verse 3, pick out from among... You seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Seven men were selected so that the apostles could remain faithful. The congregation was to look over the men that were there and present seven of them to the apostles. Uh, They would need to meet the approval of the apostles Because these men would be performing a pastoral role. They would be assisting the pastor in a pastoral role of helping to physically shepherd the flock. And this leads us to some spiritual leadership as well. Because occasionally a deacon, and we see Stephen was one of the deacons, and he was out there preaching. So occasionally these deacons would not only have to care for physical needs, but would have to deal with some spiritual needs, have to answer some questions about the Bible or uh, counsel someone that they had become close to in the church. And so they would need approval from the congregation and then from the apostles. And then as they laid hands on them, the congregation yet again, right? So what are the requirements that are listed in our passage today? Well, They must be men. That's number one. Women certainly have a vital place in the ministry of the church. And listen, ladies, we couldn't do it without you. But this job of a deacon is for men. Call from among yourselves seven men. It's not very confusing. They must be from among you. Certainly this This plays a role in this. It should be people that were part of the congregation. But I think more than that, he's saying people who have been proven um, among the congregation, that you know them and you know 
their spiritual lives and their spiritual condition. You know their example. They must have a good reputation. Men of integrity and above reproach. That just simply means there's no foothold where someone could tear them down because uh, maybe they're swindling somebody in business or, or they're talking bad to their spouse or something like that. There's no way that you could talk bad about them because they are above reproach. They also need to have a good reputation because sometimes they would handle the resources of the church. They would handle money. They would handle uh, you know, some of the food and distributing. And so they would be handling the resources of the church, so they had to be trustworthy and of good reputation. Next, they must be filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. Uh, you know, this is, this is important. They must be spiritual men. It can't be a popularity contest. It can't be someone who, who is not respected as a spiritual man in the church. They must be, and, and what it means to be filled with the Spirit is yielding our lives to the control of the Spirit. You know, there's a passage of Scripture in the book of Romans that says, Do not be drunk with wine, instead be filled with the Spirit. The implication of that verse is when you're drunk with wine, it impairs you and takes control of you. Instead of being controlled by uh, you know, liquor or whatever, we should be controlled by the Spirit. So it is that we are submitting and yielding our lives to the Spirit. And so they must be men who yield themselves to the Spirit. And they must be wise. That is, they must be knowledgeable in not only spiritual things, but practical things. Sometimes these men will be called upon to lead out in the decision-making process of the church, so they must have sound judgment. So these are the qualifications that are laid out in the book of Acts, chapter 6. Turn in your Bibles over to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy, in chapter 3, in verse 8. First, come on, let me hear those pages, y'all. I like it when I hear the pages turn. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 8. It says this in verse 8. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, not sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> so what are the requirements listed in the first Timothy passage? First, men again. Men. So men serve as deacons. Men of dignity. We've talked a little bit about this. They're people of integrity. They're well respected in the church. People look up to them as a spiritual leader in the church. Not double-tongued. And this simply means they're not doing one thing over here and saying another thing over here. They're not double-tongued. They're not putting on a fake or pretense. Not addicted to much wine. Listen, we don't want a drunk as a deacon. And the policy of our church is that they're teetotalers. They don't drink. Not fond of sordid gain. They're not a cheater. Or a swindler when it comes to, to cheating people out of money. Uh, they don't run a business and run their prices up, things like that. Believer in the gospel. Now, this should go without saying. <laughs> a deacon should believe the gospel. That is, that we're all sinners, we're all going to hell, we're all under condemnation already. Jesus died on the cross to make the the salvation and redemption of his people available. 
The way you're saved is through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. By accepting his gift, he dies in your place and takes your sin and dies for it, takes your punishment, and it's put on him, and then gives you his righteousness so that you can stand before God, totally blameless, and must be a believer in the gospel. Simply, they must be saved, and they must know how to be saved to tell others how to be saved. Guiltless before God. Now, you remember I said earlier there's no such thing as a perfect deacon? Well, I'm not saying here that a person has to be perfect to be a deacon, but what I am saying here is that the general pattern of their lives is they don't have hidden sin. They may sin from time to time, but there's no hidden sin in their lives. They're not dealing with this hidden sin. And then they are tested to see if they are above reproach. That is, nothing can be said that's bad about them. Husband of one wife. Not only does this mean they should only have one wife, they've not been divorced, it also means that they should be faithful to the wife they have. They should honor her and treat her with respect. And then they should be good managers of their household. If a guy has got an unruly group of children, they can't control their own children, how can they be expected to manage the household of God? Now, if, if people don't control their children in their household, they shouldn't be allowed to serve in that way in the church. And I guess he could even have an unruly spouse because... You know, this talks about the wives. They're not to be gossips and slanders and things like that. So their wives, the wives of these men should be respected too. Did you know a wife can disqualify a man from serving in the pastorate? Did you know a wife can disqualify a man from serving as deacon? And then look at verse 13 again in 1 Timothy chapter 3. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also a great confidence in the faith that is in Jesus Christ. The Bible lays out very specific qualifications for deacons. And it is our job as a church and the, and the deacon's job as the ones holding this process accountable. It is our job to make sure that the people that we put forward and elect as deacons meet these qualifications. And we must take this job very seriously. We shouldn't flippantly write a name down on a sheet of paper and turn it in. We shouldn't just consider this a popularity contest. This should be a reason, spiritual, prayerful nomination. A reason, prayerful, spiritual process of talking to these men. And a reasoned and spiritual and prayerful process of actually voting on the day that we elect these men to serve as deacon. And men in the congregation, if you are nominated to serve as a deacon, you will have an opportunity to pray over and look at these qualifications. And you will have the opportunity to either eliminate yourself or to submit to being elected as a deacon. When you do this, I'm just going to tell you like this. If you want to serve as a deacon, for some reason besides God is telling you you need to do this, the best deacons I've ever seen said, well, I, I really... I really don't feel qualified to serve, and I, I really am not sure if I should, but I feel like God wants me to. Those are the best deacons because they're following the calling of God. And I believe God puts a, a calling on our lives to serve in this role. If you want to serve just so that you can pass out the juice and the bread, if you want to serve just so you can have a little bit of clout and maybe you think a little bit of control in the church, 
If you want to serve for any other reason than you feel like God is calling you to do this, then you're doing it for the wrong reason. And you will have the opportunity to pray over this and make a thoughtful, prayerful, reasoned decision, spiritual decision, just like the rest of us, of whether you will serve. And I've had guys over the years that were nominated to serve as deacons who have said, you know what, I feel like this is something that God wants me to do, but I feel like he doesn't want me to do it yet. I've had people say that. And now two of these men at the previous church I was at that have put us off for two or three years when they were elected are now serving as deacons in the church I left. They finally did submit. And listen, they are great deacons. But they waited until they felt like God was ready for them to serve. So listen, we need another deacon, maybe two. But we want people who are qualified, called out by God, and willing to serve. So if we get some deacons, great. If we don't, these knotheads can handle it. But I appreciate their willingness to serve since I've been here as your pastor. Look at, over back at Acts chapter 7, and we'll look at the results. Acts chapter 6, verse 7, I'm sorry. And the word of God continued to increase, and, mul- and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many priests became obedient to the faith. <coughs> what were the results? The church grew. What were the results? Everything went well. The result is that the deacons helped the apostles to devote themselves to the spiritual things of shepherding the church, and this church continued to grow, and multitudes were added to the church, even those who were, had been serving in the temple as priests came to faith in Jesus Christ. That's what this is. That's what's important about that little tag on the end of there. There were those who were serving as priests in the church who came to faith in Jesus Christ. So when we're doing the right things as far as caring for the flock with the help of the deacons and the church staff, when we're focused on shepherding in the right way, when the pastor is free to be the equipper of the church first before the pastoral caregiver, it enables the church to be focused on the ministry. Now, when deacons don't do their jobs, it does put extra pressure on the pastor to be more spread thin. The church must be optimized for growth, and the church pastor and the staff cannot do it without help. No matter how small the church, no matter how big the church, the deacons are a vital part of the ministry team. Now, while not all deacons have the same amount of time they can devote to the ministry, there are those in our deacon body who are retired and have a little more time. And so uh, the main idea is not that they are the person that gives the most time, but that the time that they do have, they give wholeheartedly to the Lord. The sermon is to help us understand the purpose of a deacon. The purpose is to help us understand how they could function in the church. The challenge is to our deacons for what they should be doing in the church. And the challenge is that we are called to pray for our deacons, to encourage our deacons, to uplift our deacons. And and then here's another thing, to enable our deacons the opportunity to serve. Well, I don't want to call my deacon of the week. I want to call the pastor. I want to talk to the pastor. I don't want to call my deacon. He doesn't really know me. Could it be that he doesn't know you because you've never never called him? Our deacons of the week are there. And you can talk to them as well as you can talk to me. Enable them the opportunity to serve. I promise you these men want to serve. These men want to be there for you. They want to fulfill their role. They want to go visiting. They want to do all the things that deacons are supposed to do. But if you don't give them the opportunity to do that, 
then you are hindering their ability to serve you. You say, well, I don't want to be a bother. But we want to help you. We want to help you grow. We want to help you physically if you need help physically. We want to be there for you. I'm going to ask our deacons to come forward at this time. I'd like for them to stand and face the congregation. Some of you may have been in the military, so you know how to make a straight line. <laughs> These are our current deacons. These are the men that you should be praying for in the church in addition to your church staff. These are the men that you should be giving the opportunity to serve. And they are willing to serve you. At this time, I would like for you to stand with me. We're going to pray for our deacons right now. We're also going to pray for our deacons that may be coming on through this deacon election process. Join me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for these men who are willing to serve. We thank you, Lord, for these men who are willing to come along beside me and the rest of the church staff to help us to free up some time to be able to focus on those things that are vitally important to the spiritual and the biblical growth of the church. Amen. We thank you that you have called these men out to serve. And while we know that there is no perfect man anywhere in this church today, we thank you, Lord, that these guys are committed to be spiritual leaders in the church, shepherding leaders in the church. They're committed and willing to serve you in the church. And, Father, we pray, God, first for them in their spiritual lives, their own spiritual lives. They can't be the leaders and the caregivers that we need without them first being focused on you. So we pray for their spiritual condition. We pray for their lives. We pray for any difficulty that they may be having now in their lives uh, in, their, in their physical health, uh, Father, in their spiritual health. Father, if there's any sin that's going on, we pray, God, that you will help them this morning to just come to you in repentance. And, Father, we pray that these men serve you and serve you well. And we pray, God, for them constantly that they will be faithful to you. Father, that they will be able to resist temptations that come their way. And, Father, that they will serve well in this congregation so that we can reach this community for you. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that they support their pastor. I thank you, Lord, that they stand in the gap and praying for me. I thank you, Lord, that these men are there anytime I ask them to step up and go and visit somebody or to call somebody or talk to somebody or just to do anything that we ask them. We pray, God, that you will bless them and help them to serve. We pray for our congregation, Lord, that you will give us opportunities to serve them. Father, that you will help them to feel comfortable calling a deacon. Father, that you will help them to feel comfortable talking to a deacon about their spiritual concerns or their physical concerns. And Father, if there's widows in our congregation that need some help, I pray that they're not too proud to ask a deacon because, Father, these guys are willing to help. Father, whether it be to help them at a situation at their home with a repair or whether it be to, to do another thing like pray for them or talk to their child about Christ or whatever, use these opportunities for these men to serve. And Father, we'll be sure to commit to you all that we need to commit to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Bless these deacons. Amen. Y'all yeah. be seated for a second. Yeah. Y'all can be seated. At this time, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. Because we're having the Lord's Supper, it's an opportunity for us to reflect upon our own lives. The Bible teaches that we should partake in the Lord's Supper in a manner that's worthy. And that means that if there's any sin in our hearts or sin in our lives, any rebellion in our hearts or rebellion in our lives, we must first repent before we partake of the supper. The supper is an opportunity to remember what Christ has done in our lives 
his body that was broken, his blood that was spilled. It's an opportunity for us to reflect upon the great sacrifice to redeem us a place in heaven and a place with our Savior. And so we must, at this time, repent and prepare ourselves to serve the Lord. The Bible also teaches that we're not to partake in an unworthy manner, that is, if we're unwilling to repent or if we're not a baptized believer. This is for the church. So you pray about that. This is your opportunity. This is an invitation. Maybe you had a hard heart towards a deacon, and you need to repent of that. Maybe, maybe God is dealing with you, and you might need to serve as a deacon, and you need to deal with that. This is your opportunity. Maybe you're here, and you'd like to be saved. There's only one way through Jesus Christ. You come and be saved. Maybe you're here, and you'd like to unite with our church. This will be your opportunity. Father, we pray, God, that you'll bless our time of invitation, that you'll help us to focus on who you are and what you've called us to do and how you've called us to live. Help us to repent and reflect on the own spiritual condition in our lives so that when we partake, we do so in a manner worthy of your calling. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. You can pray right where you are. You can come to this altar. You can also come and talk with me. I'll be glad to pray with you. This is your opportunity. You come right now. The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend The agonies of Calvary You the pearl Jesus, thank